to a scripture we often read on Communion Sunday. We have prepared the Lord's table, and uh, all are invited to come. All who are His are invited to come. At the end of the service, we'll be serving Communion. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is considered the Communion scripture, let me move some furniture around. We always like to uh, focus on this the first Sunday of every month. Starting at verse 23, we'll just read a little bit. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Corinth. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you, ye as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. I wanted this morning to just focus on that last verse that I read. And the very last part of that verse, the last three words. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, for as often as you celebrate the Lord's table and take communion, He says, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Those last three words we want to think about this morning. Until he comes. How many people know that Jesus is coming back? He's coming back to this place. He didn't just leave. He's coming back. And when we partake of the Lord's table, we look back to what he did when he was on Calvary, when he died on the cross. We look back to what he did, but we're also looking forward to what he's going to do. Is this is Donna saying that song, live for Jesus, that, that's what matters. What we do as Christians is all geared toward the time when we're going to go be with him. Jesus is coming back. I don't know if he'll come back in my lifetime. Or if he'll come back in another hundred years or a thousand, I don't know. He, hasn't, he has not given me the time frame, and he has not given anybody the time frame, by the way. But he's coming back. And we're admonished in God's word to live as though he might be coming back tomorrow. Or maybe this afternoon. I want to talk this morning a little bit, and I want to encourage you, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, to be ready for his return. Jesus was crucified in the flesh. He was buried in the flesh. He was resurrected in his body. He wasn't just brought back to life. There were a number of people in the Bible that we can read about who came back to life. We all know the story about Lazarus, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus came back to life. And there were others that Jesus brought back from the dead. But those, all those people had to die again. There were people in the Old Testament who had died and through the acts of a prophet or through the acts of God of some kind came back to life. God showed that he is able to give life to the dead. But they all had to die again. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he was resurrected forever. Doesn't have to die again. And the promise to us is we might taste death in this body, but there's going to come a time when we're going to be resurrected and we will never have to die again. I'm not looking forward to doing it the first time, <laughs> if, it, if, if he it, it keeps his coming. You know, someday I'm going to die. And when you think about death without Christ, it, it kind of stir up a little fear and a little uncertainty because you don't know what's on the other side. But see, Jesus has been there and back. So we can live for Jesus and not have to be afraid of dying because of the promise in his word. Jesus spoke much of his second coming. We know he came here the first time as a babe in a manger. 
And he lived his life, and when he was about 30, 33 years old, he was crucified on Calvary, died for our sins. He was raised from the dead. But he made promises that he was going to return. In Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and we're not going to turn there, that's, that's a portion of scripture called the Olivet Discourse, because that's a place where Jesus was giving a teaching on the Mount of Olives. There's a place called the Mount of Olives. Uh, which is to the east of Jerusalem. It's there today. If you go to Jerusalem, you can go to the Mount of Olives. When Jesus was there with his disciples, it was the last week of his life before the crucifixion, and they were asking him questions, and he gave, a, he gave a teaching on his second coming. And he said a number of things, and you can read that passage of Scripture if you want, uh, when you get a chance, but just to, to give you an idea, he, he, he gave some signs of his return. He said things like this would happen. Deceptions. False Christs, wars and rumors of wars. Now, some folks, they hear about wars, they say, well, there's always been wars on the planet. But, you know, in Jesus' day, if something was happening in the Orient, they would never hear about it in Israel. If something was happening in North America, uh, they would never hear about it in Israel. But today, on the other side of the world, through satellites and Internet and everything else, we know what's going on everywhere. Wars and rumors of wars are, are going on. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes, anti-Semitism. Hatred of the Jews, that's been going on for thousands of years. Uh, betrayals, hatred, false prophets, lawlessness abounding. Love decreasing, martyrdoms, increased satanic activity, excessive overindulgence are signs of his return. Now you could read those things, you can say, boy, it sounds like today, but people that lived in 1100 thought it sounded like their day. And people that lived in 500 AD thought it sounded like their day. But there are some things that are peculiar to the times that we live in today. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. And we're going to get in God's Word in a minute. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. Jesus was crucified about 33 AD. We're not sure because the calendars have been changed, but around between 25 and 35 AD, Jesus was crucified. 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem, the temple that Jesus went into and worshipped and cleansed the temple, we can read about in the New Testament, was destroyed by the Romans. They marched in and they destroyed the temple. About 110 AD, about 110 years, uh, or about 70 years after Christ's crucifixion, all the Jews were thrown out of Jerusalem and they weren't allowed back in their holy city. So from 110 AD, until just a few decades ago, Jerusalem was under the control of the Gentiles. In 1948, after World War II, what happened? The nation of Israel was re-established. See, from 70 AD until that time, there was no Israel on the map. You look on the map today and it says Israel. Before that, before 1948, it would say Palestine. So something very peculiar to the time that we live in is the fact that there is a nation of Israel. Even though they are not there in belief, they are not the prophesied nation that we read about in the Old Testament because they still don't believe in Jesus as their Messiah. They are there. That's a prerequisite for the return of Christ. Because when he comes back, he's going to come back to the nation of Israel. The Bible says when he returns bodily, he's going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives, which is the same place... That we can look in, in Jerusalem, you look to the east, and there's the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus is coming back. We don't know when, but we know where. Another thing that has to happen is that there has to be a Jewish temple. Now, remember I said the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. The Jews are going to have to build another temple in Jerusalem. Because a lot of things are going to revolve around that temple. A lot of things are going to happen at the end times around that temple. But you can be assured, and I can guarantee you this much, that there's going to be another temple built, and Jesus is coming back to the Mount of Olives, as prophesied in God's Word. One of the earliest letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, two of the earliest letters, are the two letters that he wrote to the church in a city called Thessalonica, First and Second Thessalonians. And the main theme of these letters, the earliest letters that he wrote, the main theme of these letters was the return of Jesus Christ. Back in those days, ninth, uh, 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 over 1900 years ago, they were expecting His return. 
And Christians throughout the centuries have been expecting Jesus to come back. Are you expecting him to come back? But we're, you know what, we're a day closer than we've ever been. Just a couple of brief scriptures in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look at verse, uh, just verse 9, without, I hate to take things out of context, but Paul is writing, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Paul was talking about how he went to the, the city of Thessalonica and, and preached the gospel. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's talking to the Christians there. And to wait, you know, have, you, have you turned from your idols to serve God? <laughs> okay, just a question. You can ask yourself. See, because I figure, you know, when I got saved, God told me I had to turn from some things to serve Him. There's some things I had to take out of my life to serve Him. I wasn't going to preach on this this morning, but we must since we read it. There's, God told me that when I got saved, He showed me that there were some things in my life that I had to get rid of. Because they were idols that I had worshipped. And before I could turn to Him and worship Him truly in spirit and truth, I had to get rid of the things I worshipped in my life. And he says this, he says that you turn, from God, or, uh, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God living for Jesus. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. He's telling the Christians way back then and he's telling us today, listen, we need to be waiting anxiously, uh, patiently waiting for Christ to return. And while we're waiting, we need to be doing everything we know how to do to keep ourselves from the stuff that polluted us before we were saved. He says, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Keep that phrase in your mind, the wrath to come. Turn over to chapter 2. Just, just looking at some passages here. In verse, look at verse 19. Paul says, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you, he's speaking to the Christians, are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? We're going to be, when Jesus comes back, we're going to be in His presence. Okay? When He comes back, literally, physically, we're going to be in His presence. Now, just look at chapter 3. And look at verse... Look at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as, you, as we do toward you. Verse 13. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all, with all His saints. When Jesus comes back and sets His feet on the Mount of Olives, all His saints are going to be with Him. That's us. That's us. We're going to be with Him. Well, wait a minute. If He's coming back, and we're here, how are we going to come back with Him if we're here? Well, this takes us to chapter 4. And verse 13. See, some of you know what I'm talking about, and you ought to be getting excited. Because we show forth his death until he comes. This is what we're waiting for. Listen, chapter 4 and verse 13. Some of us could probably quote this by heart. Paul was writing, the church at Thessalonica, the, the Christians there, if you know the story, Paul started a church there, then he went south to Athens, and they sent some messengers to him, and they had some questions about some things. So he wrote this letter in answer to questions that they had about what was going on. And he said this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. What's he mean by that? Those who have died. Okay, very good. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You ever lost a loved one? You get sorrowful, don't you? You get sad because you're going to miss him. You have to say goodbye. But what Paul is telling us, he says, as believers, well, we're going to be sad when we lose somebody we love. But we don't have to be sad like the world is sad. Why, Paul? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Okay. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That means when Jesus comes back, those who have died are going to be coming back with him. 
not as ghosts floating around in the air, but in their bodies. Listen to what he says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, in verse 15, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, those of us, if Jesus were to come back today, and we're alive and we're here, we will not, the King James says prevent, but it means go before, that we will not go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall what? Rise. There's going to be a lot of holes in the ground. Because the bodies of believers are going to come up out of the grave. And they're not going to come up like some horror movie that you would see, all kind of grisly. But they're going to come up, they're going to come up renewed and restored, brand new. Just like the same kind of body Jesus had when he was resurrected. They're not going to be like ghouls, like, you know, night of the living dead. They're not going to be like that. They're going to come up perfect. And then he says this. Then we which are alive and remain. If we're here when Jesus comes back and we're still living, we shall be caught up. See, if they wanted to translate it a different way, they could have used the word rapture. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now listen, here's the promise. This is what we're waiting for. We're taking communion and we show forth his death until he come. Because when he comes, he's going to bring life to all those who have died. Now the spirits are with him. Because absent from the body, present with the Lord. When, some, when a believer dies, their spirit goes to be with God. Their body goes in the ground. But the time is coming when the trump will sound. And the archangel will sound his trump. And Christ will return to meet those in the air, that the dead in Christ will rise, and if we happen to be alive at that time, we're going to be changed, it says in Corinthians, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I'm not going to no longer have knees that hurt anymore. Like that. That's the promise. That's the blessed hope. What he's talking about here in Thessalonians is the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the righteous, the rapture of the church, the catching away of believers. We're showing forth his death by communion until he comes to catch us away. That's happening. That's coming. Don't let anybody tell you that that's not going to happen. Because that's in God's word. Somebody might say, well, when's that going to happen? Well, he didn't give us a date. Some folks have tried to give us dates. You know, so if you've been around long enough in the church, you know, you know, 77 reasons why rapture is going to happen in 1977 and 88 reasons why and everything else. Everybody has tried to figure out, but Jesus said, if somebody tells you they know when it's going to happen, you can mark that off. It ain't going to happen then. Because nobody knows when. But we know that it's going to happen. And we ought to live every day like it's going to happen tomorrow. Because here's what's going to happen. If you put, you know, we could do a whole series of messages, and we have, and maybe will again, a whole series of messages on, on, on the end time stuff. We, we did a thing on Revelation. And we know that there's going to be a seven year period of great tribulation on this earth. Of God's wrath being poured out. Now somebody says, man, there's been tribulation on this planet for the last thousand, couple thousand years. There's been trouble. And persecution. And all kinds of stuff, bad stuff happening on this planet. Tribulation is going on every day. Now see, that's man's wrath. All the stuff that's happening on this planet today is the wrath of man. It's what man does. We talk about famines and pestilences and things like that. Most, today, most of those things are caused by man. Somebody trying to starve somebody else out. Stalin did that back in Russia. He wiped out something like 9 million people in the Ukraine because they weren't going along with his program. Starved them to death. That's happening right now. Pestilences, some of this stuff I believe is man-made. I really do. We're, we're experiencing the wrath of man right now. But there's coming a time on this planet and it's promised throughout the scriptures that the world is going to experience the wrath of God. I don't want to be here to experience the wrath of God. That's why I said that one scripture that we read, that, that we're, we're, we're not appointed unto wrath. Okay? 
Listen to what he says in chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment, when you see that term, day of the Lord, so comes as a thief in the night. If somebody wants to rob your house in the night, do they call you up at 11 o'clock and say, excuse me, I'll be around about 3 o'clock in the morning. Can you please leave your front door open? Okay. No, they don't, do they? For when they shall say, See, now, I, I preached this one time before, and I said, there's us and they, okay? Us and they. He says, for when they shall say, who's they? People don't believe in God. The godless world. The governments and the nations that are trying to eliminate God from everything. For when they shall say, peace and safety, when they got everything figured out, when they got a cure for swine flu, when they got the peace talks worked out in uh, Israel, when they got everything, when they got the, the nuclear stuff in North Korea, they got that taken care of. When they get everything worked out, when the, the politicians and the statesmen and, the, and uh, the, the governments get everything all worked out, and they say, man, we finally got it under control without God. Because they don't give two hoots about what God thinks. When, they, when they, everybody's saying peace and safety, see, this is why when you read in a paper about peace talks, don't kid yourselves. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. When the world thinks they got everything together, we are the world. We are his people. Ooh, I feel warm and fuzzy and happy. When we got everything worked out, when mankind figures out, thinks that they finally got everything figured out, they got the cures, they got the remedies, they got the food, they got the peace, they got all this other stuff. Then God shows his hand. And the wrath of God comes upon this planet. And if you get over in Revelation and start reading about all those, the, the, the vile judgments and the bold judgments, all these things, you find out that the wrath of God is something that man could do nothing about. We've seen little glimpses of it. You can't do anything about a hurricane except go running high. You can't stop wind. You can't stop flood water. Power all the sandbags you want. That water comes, it's going to come. You can't stop the weather. You can't stop an earthquake. When God pours out His wrath on this planet, it's going to be beyond anything that mankind has ever seen. Listen to what Paul says. For when they shall say in verse 3 of chapter 5, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, now see, there's, there's them and you. But ye, brethren, believers, are not in darkness that that they should overtake you as a thief, you are children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep and, and, uh, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Live for Jesus. That's what matters. For they that, this is verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9. For God has not appointed us unto wrath. God's not going to pour His wrath out on His people. We've been, we've been getting wrath poured out on us. The, the believers have been getting wrath poured out on them for 2,000 years. From man. Do you think God's going to pour His wrath out on us too? Oh, no. See, if, if you read all the scriptures, and again, there's, there's so much. You know, now we take the Lord's table until He comes. But we're going to trade this for a marriage supper. We're, we're no longer going to show His death, but we're going to celebrate our relationship with Christ. We're the bride of Christ. The body of Christ. Now, just real quickly and what's it going to be like in Luke, Luke chapter 17 if you have your Bibles turn it with me it's 
It's going to be like when Jesus comes back. This is what we're waiting for. How many people are waiting for Jesus to come back? Luke chapter 17 and look at verse 26. Jesus is speaking here. If you have a Bible with red letters, this is going to be in red. And as it was in the days of Noah. Remember about Noah? In the days of Noah, there was a lot of wickedness on the, on the earth. There was a lot of evil on the planet. And God, it said that God repented. He was sorry he made man. That's what the word says. But he found, there was one man that found grace in God's eyes, and his name was Noah. And he gave Noah a command. He said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a big boat. It had not rained up to that time. They didn't know what rain was. It, it was like a, a, a greenhouse type thing. The ground was watered uh, naturally. And, and the whole world, some believe the whole world was like a, like a plush garden, like a plush jungle even on the poles, because of the way the, the climate was. It had never rained. God said, no, I want you to build this big boat. I want you to take the animals on it. And people shrug that off and they laugh at it and say, oh, that's a fairy tale and that's folklore. No, it's not. Some people say, how do you get them big animals on there? Maybe he took the babies. <laughs> we don't know, but I believe every word of it. I believe that God told Noah, I want you to build this ark. It took him 120 years to build this ship. He said, he said to put this pitch on it. That pitch is the same word that's used for the word atonement. It's interesting. It, that's a whole other message. But he told him to build this boat. And for 120 years, the Bible says that Noah preached to his generation. He says, you guys better get ready to get on this ark because God's sending judgment. And they probably laughed at him. And they probably scoffed at him. The only people that entered that ark was his family. There was eight of them all together. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Noah preached for 120 years, but when God told him to get in that ark, he got in there and God closed that door and rain started falling. And water started coming up from the from the fountains of the deep. And the people were like, and he went to the ark and he started pounding on the door and said, Noah! It's too late. It's too late. The judgment came upon the earth. And the people who had listened to the preaching and rejected it and mocked it, how many people are mocking the message of the cross today? Even people sitting in churches are mocking the message of the cross. There's churches that are taking the cross off the wall because they think it's distasteful. Don't they understand that that's our hope? The blood of Jesus, the body and blood of Christ. We're, we do this, we, sh we, uh, we show forth His death until He come. We're depending on His death to keep us now. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, it was in the days of Lot. How many know who Lot was? Lot was Abraham's nephew. And Lot lived in Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. How many? We all heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, haven't we? Wicked, evil place. He says, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. What happened? God sent angels. There was one righteous man in the city of Sodom, and his name was Lot. And God sent angels in there to get him out of Lot. And they had to drag him out because he liked living there. <laughs> Lot liked living in Sodom. He hated the sin. They had to drag him out. And what happened? Fire and brimstone consumed the city. What's Jesus saying here? He said, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Listen, judgment is coming upon the face of this earth. Don't kid yourself. God is angry. He's so angry, his cup is filling up and it's running over with wrath. And when God pours it out, I don't want to be here. I want to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
In that day, he says in Luke, and he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Listen, when Jesus comes to take you away, don't you look back and try to hold on to anything. There ain't nothing in this place that's worth taking. And he says this, remember Lot's wife. Remember the story of Lot's wife? When they were running from Sodom, the angel said, get out of here and don't turn around. Keep running. Lot's wife just said, I'm just going to get one more look and turn around and look. And turn into a pillar of salt. How much do you, what, what do you love on this earth? What is so precious on this earth that you're not willing to let go of for God? Live for Jesus. That's what matters. You see, we do show forth His death until He comes. We're going to prepare, we prepare the Lord's table, and we're going to have communion in just a minute or two. But I want to ask you this morning, are you ready for Christ to come back? Are you ready for His return? Are you living your life as though if He would come back today, if that trumpet would sound today, and He would catch you up, and you would appear in His presence, could you stand before Him and, and say, Lord, I've done everything I could do with what you've given me? Or will you hide your head in shame and say, Lord, I've, I've just, like, just like the one with the talents, He said, I've, I've, I've taken it and I've, put, I've wrapped it in a napkin and I've buried it in the ground. What would you be? Be assured of this. Christ is coming back. <clears throat> might be tomorrow. might not be in, for another, I don't know how many years. I, I don't know when. But he's coming back. And, he's, and he's, he's getting ready to blow the trumpet. And he's getting ready to catch away his... Can you just imagine what would it be like if in a, in a twinkling of an eye this place would be empty? I hope it would be empty. <laughs> Do you know there's going to be lots of folks left behind sitting in church pews? There's going to be a lot of people sitting in church pews left behind. Why? Because there's a lot of people that come to church don't really care what God thinks. They don't, they don't care what God thinks. They think, well, I'll go to church, and I'll go through the motion, and I'll, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and yeah, okay, I'll, and yeah, it'll be all right, and I'll, I'll feel good about myself. If, listen, if you haven't sold out to Christ, it doesn't matter how. You can go to church every day if you want to. It doesn't matter. What really matters is, have you given your all for Christ? That's what really matters. That's what counts. I, uh, sometimes I, I get terrified by the thought that I would stand before God someday. And he would say to me, you sold them a bill of goods. You stood up behind that pulpit and you said stuff and you patted them on the head and made them feel good about just doing whatever they want to do. God help me. I don't want to have to face that. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says you must be born again. The Bible says you must be sold out. The Bible says you must turn from your idols to God. The choice is yours. It's up to you. See, I've, I've said what, what God has given me to say. Now, we prepared the Lord's table. We all are invited to come and partake of the Lord's table. All who know Christ. You don't, you don't have to be a member of this church. All you have to do is be saved. You have to know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Say, so how can I know that? It's like this. Wait, how many here raise kids? You raise kids. If your kid would call you, now I'm talking about like adult parents now, and kids are grown up. If your kid would call you and say, hey, I'd like to come over and say hi, would you say, well, okay, but here's what you've got to do first. You've got to fill out an application. You've got to make sure everything is filled in just right. Then you've got to ask me like 30 times, and then you've got to call your brother and have him ask me 30 times. And then, and then you have to go through, and you have to do it just exactly like I tell you, because if you don't, then you can't come. You would never say that to your child, would you? No. You would say, come over. And especially if you're an adult, 
with a, with a, with a, with a, with a child, you know, you would love to, sometimes we don't hear enough from our kids. See, there's some of us that think that to approach God, we have to, you know, go through some kind of motion, go through the, the bond, and, and, and say so many things, so many ways. You know, is that the way, is that the way, the word says that we have a spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. And it's not a ritual, it's not a thing that we go through, you know, once a month, well, it's communion Sunday, so we'll take communion. Oh, no, we're showing forth his death until he comes back. We're partaking the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something magical. It's not something that uh, uh, something happens where it's like a magic pill. What we're doing is we're saying we are believers. We have Christ in us and we're in Him. Now I want to ask you before we have the girls come and, and lead you up to take the elements. We have an open communion. You don't have to be a member of this church. All that's important is that you're born again and saved. And you don't have to answer me. That's between you and God. But I want, to, I want to take a minute and I want to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to ask, Joe, could you come, come up and just prepare to play a little something when we have communion? But I want to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we're expecting Jesus to return. You promised in your word that you're going to send him back. You promised in your word that he's going to come back and make all things right. He's going to establish his kingdom on this earth. And I pray, Lord, and I ask you this morning, as we sit here and prepare to partake of the Lord's table, Father, that you will help us take a good, hard look at ourselves this morning. That you would help us examine ourselves, even as the Word says, that we would judge ourselves, nobody else, but that we would judge ourselves. Am I in the faith? Have I given everything to God? Am I born again? Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the assurance of our faith this morning. Not because we're in church, not because we're going to take communion, but because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses us from all sin. I pray, Lord, that as we partake of this cup and this bread, that you would help us make a decision in our lives that we're going to live for Jesus. That the things of this world that are so flighty and so meaningless, that we place a lot of importance on, that really have nothing to do with eternity. I pray, God, you will help us make that decision to set those things aside. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask.